Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar this week uh, in the RedTech Europe educational series. And today we're going to talk about chemistry, and we have our presenter Xavier with us, uh, who will tell you more about this topic. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A section, which you can find on the bottom of your screen, and we will uh, answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded, so if you want to listen to it again or want to forward the recording to your colleagues, please feel free to do so um, afterwards. So now I would like to give the floor to Xavier, who can tell you everything about uh, chemistry. Thank you very, very much for the nice uh, introduction, Elke. So it's a pleasure for me to present just the basics of energy curable chemistry. Just the basics, but I could not resist. Uh, I had to uh, introduce a few more slides compared to the uh, package that was prepared by the RADTEC. Uh, I hope I will, uh, it will be clear for every one of us. And of course, I will leave some time for questions at the end of my presentation. So definition. Energy curing is the transformation of specifically formulated liquids into solids by UV light or electron beam. The advantages of energy curing, it's almost instantaneous, fraction of a second most of the time. It is solvent free. The production rates can be very high. The formulations are stable as a one component system. It's a low and eco energy technology. And the waste products are less dangerous than in many other coatings processes. So it's a very eco friendly uh, technology process which is uh, gaining uh, market shares compared to other cutting technology uh, in all regions of the world, actually, these days. A way to illustrate, huh, you have a, a resin formulation, a liquid. You put it under UV photons or EB electrons, and you end up in a fraction of a second with a cross-link polymer network that can form a coating on the substrate, if it's what you want to do. So you need some uh, reactive molecules. And for UV and EB curing, these reactive molecules are most of the time acrylates, or in some cases, metacrylates. There are other chemical functionalities, reactive functionalities that you can use, uh, but they are today less important from a commercial point of view. If you are using photons and UV light, you will need a photo initiator to generate free radical species. And there are two types, and I will explain later in the presentation what what they are. So some very basic polymer chemistry. These are the various steps which are described in the literature for free radical polymerization. So there is a, a free radical formation uh, when it's UV you use a photo initiator. When it's EB, you don't need to, to use a photo initiator because the, the electrons from uh, EB, from the electron beam, are powerful enough to break any bond, any chemical bond in your formulation. So you don't need a photo initiator to generate free radicals. Once you have free radicals, you have initiation, the free radical. The first free radical will react with a monomer unit. There will be propagation step with the addition one after each other of monomer units. The growth can end by 
chain transfer where the free radical will grab a proton in the neighborhood and uh, the growth will end, but a new chain will be will start, a new polymer, polymer chain will start. Or you could have termination when two free radicals meet each other, they will react very fast to produce an inert molecule, but of very high molecular weight. So this mechanism of free radical polymerization is used widely in the industry. Uh, talk about emulsion polymerization. This is a free radical process. Bulk polymerization for PMA machines. This is a free radical process. So this free radical polymerization, you don't find it only in uh, energy curing applications, of course. So this is another view. Here I take a, a, a monofunctional acrylate. Hmm. You can see the free radical from the initiator reacting with a tail at the double bond. Formation of a free radical at the head, which is stabilized by the carbonyl group, which is in alpha. This free radical can propagate by addition of monomer units, and you will always form the same free radical with a stabilization. And the termination for acrylates, it's usually by a combination as, as drawn here. So the two free radicals will find each other to generate a bond between the two growing chains. So something very important about radiation curing is that it is done most of the time under air. And in air, you have oxygen. And oxygen is highly reactive with free radicals. So as soon as you will have oxygen present, a free radical will react with oxygen. This is by far the fastest reaction that can occur. So when you have oxygen present during a, a free radical polymerization, you will have, you can have a decrease in conversion and an increase in inhibition time. So let's see what happens here. You have your substrate at the bottom and your substrate is moving under a UV lamp, which is on the top. You have your liquid formulation and you have some air on the top. So before everything goes under the lamp, you have a nice equilibrium of oxygen between the air and the liquid. Then you will go under the UV lamp. You will have photons. These photons will generate free radicals and these free radicals will react with neutralize the oxygen. So at some point in your system, you have an oxygen-free system. And then you can start the polymerization with the, foot, with the free radicals, which are left from this uh, battle with oxygen. The problem is that you still have oxygen in the air above. <laughs> and so you will have diffusion of oxygen through the top into the liquid. So you can stop the polymerization by this oxygen diffusion from the top. That's why sometimes when you do some energy curing, you will have some difficulties to cure the surface. So when it comes to what is called oxygen inhibition, what you have, what you have to keep in mind is that at any point in, your, in the formulation that you are trying to cure, you will have some oxygen and the quantity of oxygen will depend from what's coming in by diffusion through the top minus what is consumed by generation of free radicals. And of course, if you want to have free radicals present and to cure your system, you have to be at each location from the bottom to the top in a situation where 
the consumption of oxygen is achieved by the generation of free radicals. Regarding the energy source, in the industry, you will find it represents more or less 10% or less than 10% of the of the lines which are which are install, installed in Europe at least electron beam so then you there you send a beam of electron with a potential of 100 to 140 kilovolts so sometimes more and with a density of 2 to 3 megarads so I, as i said before huh, these electrons have enough energy to break any chemical bond and generate intense, uh, very fast free radicals into the liquid. For ultraviolet light, we use medium pressure mercury lamps or light emitting diodes, LEDs. The light generated by pressure mercury lamps includes far UV and near UV components which we, and we talk generally about UVA, UVB, and UVC, uh, UVC being the most energetic ones. They have also the ability to break some chemical bonds without the help of photo initiators. So another point which is important to understand is that the penetration of photons into the liquid will depend on their wavelengths. So UVCs, the highly energetic photons, will interact with matter, will interact with your liquid, and so they will be absorbed very quickly. Usually, they will not penetrate the liquid for more than half a micron, I would say. UVA, on the other hand, can go deeper into the matter, into the liquid, because they do not interact so much with matter. They will interact only with a photo initiator that you can have here. So you can penetrate at least 50 microns. Sometimes you can cure more using some other tricks, but you can have a deep penetration of UVA into your liquids. So uh, uh, part of the game in uh, formulating uh, energy curing uh, uh, coatings and, and paints is to uh, understand precisely what type of photons you are you have and, and where. So something you should uh, you should uh, keep in mind after after this talk is that. Uh, photo initiators and double bond are evenly distributed over the thickness of the coating, but photons and oxygen molecules are not. So depending on the depth of a small element of your liquid into, into your application, you could have some different results. So that's something quite unique in energy curing application. And you always have to be careful to the presence of oxygen and to the penetration of photons into your system. This is a, a view of a, or a proposed scenario for network uh, formation. So you start with a liquid, and then as you go under the lamp and start to polymerize, you will have, you will form a gel. And during the formation of this gel, so we are at low conversion, probably 20, 25%, you will start to see some volume contraction. Of course, you are bringing monomers closer to each other. So that induce a contraction of the volume uh, of, your, of your liquid. Then the liquid will turn slowly into a glassy network and there will be a, a stage, a transition, here you have still have a liquid continuous phase. And at some point, the polymerized fractions will be connected to each other. And you will have a continuous network 
of a glassy network. This is what is called the gel point. After this point, your network will not move. There will be no more volume contraction and polymerization will continue in a very concentrated solution. Okay, so let's talk more about the uh, photo initiators. They absorb UV energy and create free radicals. They are stable when they are not exposed to UV radiations. They come in solid, liquid, polymeric form. Most of the photo initiator and the cleavage products are left in the final formulation. So there are two types of photo initiators, type one and type two. And the type two work with amine synergist. There are some polymeric photo initiators, but they can be always related to type, type one or type two systems. Here you have a, a good example of a, a Norish type one system with an hydroxy ketone. You will see that there will be a cleavage of a bond under, under uh, exposure to photons. So the type one is quite simple. It's just the breakage of a weak bond into your molecule. Here in this uh, document, you will find the common names and chemical names of the most common type one photo initiators. Together with their absorption. So this is the wavelength at which they will start to react. A type two photo initiator, the situation is a little bit more complex. They need to, you need to combine them with an amine functional product. There will be an abstraction on a proton, which is alpha to an, uh, to an amine. So intermolecular cleavage by H abstraction. And then this free radical, which is here at the bottom, is the one that will initiate the polymerization. The advantage of type two is that they are less sensitive to oxygen uh, quenching. And you will, you will find here a list, uh, chemical names, and again, absorption of some common type two photo initiators. And some amine synergists. Let's talk about the main components that you will find in the energy curable formulations. Usually we distinguish between uh, uh, oligomers, low molecular weight resins, but still usually the molecular weight is above 1,000 Dalton. They are generally liquid, sometimes crystallized or paste, or all the forms can, that can take uh, on a, for example. And they are divided in several families, epoxy acrylate, polyester acrylate, full acrylate, urethane acrylate, and polyether acrylate. So the most common reactive group that you, you will find is the acrylate double bond. There are also some applications using metacrylates. Uh, I will cite uh, one, for example, metacrylates are used a lot for nail varnish formulation. Here you have the chemical structure of a bisphenol A epoxy diacrylate. So you have a bisphenol A structure in the middle, which is here. And then you have reacted acrylic acid with uh, epoxy functionality to get this structure on both sides. So this is a dye functional acrylate. And this is still 
one of the most common oligomer used in the industry, especially in furniture application. Another type is the urethane acrylate oligomer. Again, here you will have one acrylate double bond at each end of the molecule. You will recognize a diisocyanate in the molecule, which was reacted with a polyol. And then you can change the polyol and the number of functionalities in order to get a broad range of um, uh, physical properties. Polyester acrylates are polyesters obtained by the uh, uh, condensation of uh, diases and diols, for example. Uh, capped with uh, usually uh, uh, acrylic acid. So the monomers take the role of thinners in this uh, radiation curing system. They have generally a low molecular weight, less than 1,000, quite often less than 500 Dalton, and one or more functional groups. So they are divided into mono, D, Tri and multifunctional acrylate. You have some examples here HDDA, trifunctional, TMPTA, trifunctional, PPTTA, tetrafunctional. Some information you will find in uh, all the technical data sheet is the uh, presence of stabilizers. Stabilizers are radical scavengers that can prevent the polymerization of the monomers and oligomers during storage, during transportation, and during mixing and grinding process, for example. So quite often in the technical data sheet, you will find uh, a minimum guaranteed quantity of hydroquinone or MEHQ or BHT and much more molecules are today available to stabilize these acrylates. A quick word on cationic curing, which is quite small, limited to a few applications, but uh, very relevant uh, in uh, uh, metal packaging, for example. So instead of generating a free radical, you will generate a cation and this cation will induce the polymerization of an epoxide to form this type of chain. So this is one of the variation around uh, uh, energy curing applications. So the, the last slide, so I am on time. Um, so I, uh, I will be available for questions. If you start to formulate as a, as a conclusion for energy curable chemistry, you have to take care of, uh, you have to choose your raw materials, oligomers, monomers, photo initiators. You can add the pigments, of course, additives, fillers. Um, you have to choose them depending on the requirements and the applications. Uh, the wood industry is today uh, still uh, very large, but the printing industry is, is using also a lot of this uh, technology. Industrial coatings is, is growing very fast. Adhesive is very big already and electronic uh, as well. Um, you always have to be careful. You always have to be careful with the uh, HSC uh, requirement and most important, the equipment that you will use to apply and to cure the coating. And I hope that uh, after my talk, you still want to try it. And I remain to your disposal for, for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier, for your very interesting presentation. I see we indeed have a few questions that came in. Uh, the first one is, uh, let's see. Oh, it's ah, it's it's one five questions, but it's actually one. Uh, what is the best family of oligomers for? 
either exterior applications, matte anti-fingerprint, scratch resistant. Ah, that's it. <laughs> so for these three. <laughs> okay. So uh, for outdoor application, uh, yeah, we, for the yeah for outdoor Sorry. application, we we recommend uh, aliphatic urethane acrylates. They are used in many uh, interior and in exterior automotive applications and also a lot in uh, architectural panels and uh, growing in the field of metal coatings like a coal coating. So uh, there are many applications for uh, outdoor uh, coatings uh, in energy curable uh, field. And uh, all of them, to my knowledge, are formulated with aliphatic curetin acrylates. If you want to increase, I will take the third one, the hardness and the scratch resistance, you have to increase the cross-linking density of your formulation, uh, but not too much. <laughs> there is usually a maximum uh, and the location of this maximum will depend on the test that you are using to, uh, to assess the hardness of a scratch resistance or the abrasion resistance. So for each method, there will be uh, an optimum cross-linking density. Uh, that's, that's the first and most simple approach that you can take to, uh, to, 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 to formulate around this, uh, this uh, property. Um, just one more word, if you, if you cross-link such products uh, too much, you will have a very brittle surface and you can uh, end up with a hard but fragile surface like a glass can be to some type of uh, scratches, for example. So that's why there is always an optimum. The third, uh, the third was uh, anti-fingerprint. Um, you can uh, you can find on the market some fluorinated acrylates that can be used to uh, formulate such uh, coatings. Uh, you will find also silicon-based acrylates, which can be useful. And you have also the possibility to structure the surface of your coating in order to make it uh, anti-figure print. Uh, this is the case, for example, with the Exima curing. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And the next question is from Dr. Laura Ramos Rivera. Uh, are there any suggestions for multi-layers and adhesion problems? Many, <laughs> uh, many, many, many. Uh, I mean, you will find in the monomers and, and the oligomers some products which are specific, specifically designed for adhesion. Uh, they can work by uh, uh, ionic bonding. So you have some acid functional. Uh, uh, monomers or oligomers that can help. You have also some reactive uh, for, uh, oligomers and monomers working for uh, a secondary cure mechanism. Uh, you have some, you, you have many different types of, of oligomers which have been designed for, for adhesion issues. Uh, each adhesion issue is unique. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I, 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 uh, that could be the topic of a couple of hours of, of discussion. But uh, yes, there are solutions to address the, to address all addition issues. Good, good. All right. Uh, I do not have any questions in the Q and A anymore. We still have a little bit of time, so I'm allowing a minute. Uh, yes, here we go. Um, so the next question is is from Theo. Uh, thank you for your presentation. What is the best monomer to use with E-beam technology if I want the best conversion in my polymer matrix? The size of the molecules can have an impact on the kinetic? 
So what is the best monomer to use in order to improve what? Uh, with e-beam technology, if I want the best conversion in my ah, polymer best conversion. matrix. Yes, 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 yes. Um, that's a very good question. Um, first, with e-beam, you can reach a very high level of conversion uh, because you have uh, additional curing mechanisms uh, beside the a chain growth free radical polymerization you can have a you can have a lot of um, transfer of uh, of uh, free radicals uh, and grafting so you will find in practice that that high conversion is not always a, a problem with e beam and is usually better than with uv um, you should choose uh, I mean, you, it will be always easier to have a high conversion uh, if you are trying to formulate an adhesive, something which is soft with a very low TG, but will remain uh, flexible at uh, room uh, temperature. So if, if really the conversion if is, uh, uh, is, is what, you, what you want, formulate an adhesive. No, that, that being said, there are a lot of formulations on the market which are suitable for indirect food contact, low migration applications, especially with e-beam. It's not so much the molecular structure of the monomer, which is important, but really the monomer should have at least two functionalities in order to avoid uh, uh, unreacted product that could migrate. And the, the monomer should have uh, a very good purity because What's going to what's going to put you in trouble if uh, if you want to have a very high conversion and no migration of uh, residual products if uh, you want to avoid the presence of non-reactive impurities? So I hope I was clear and I under, uh, replied to your question. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yes, I see. Thank you very much indeed from Theo. Um, the next question is from Hossein. Uh, why is the amount of oligomers usually higher than monomer in formulations? This is not this is not really the case, or so it's more 50-50 if you look at market data, not, not far from 50-50 if you look globally at the European market, for example. Maybe you write a little bit less of uh, monomers than oligomers. I mean, th there are some applications where you need a very low viscosity. Uh, imagine, for example, uh, inkjet printing. Uh, in this case, you need the very, very low viscosity and the quantity of oligomer will be between zero and 10%. Okay, if you, if you are talking about spray applications, uh, yeah, viscosity is also very important. So the quantity of uh, oligomer will be limited. Um, so there are many, many cases where you put much more monomer than oligomer actually. Um, also, the industry is developing lower viscosity oligomers than before, so probably there is less the need to dilute them than, than, than before. So uh, there are all kinds of tricks you can use to uh, make the oligomer less, uh, less viscous. So it's not really true, especially for some applications where viscosity has to be uh, very low and maybe there is a trend uh, which is uh, resulting from the uh, 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 expertise of the raw material suppliers. All right, thank you very much. And then the next question is from Thomas regarding the gel point and the contraction or shrinkage of the coating during cross-linking. What is the maximum contraction in percentage? Rich with red cure coatings. Is it higher with UV or EB coatings, considering the same coating? And regarding EB coating, does it depend on the dose? 
So what is the maximum shrinkage which is possible? Uh, it's uh, the maximum shrinkage. Generally, we try to minimize shrinkage. So, so, so this is a tough question in that uh, in that way. Um, the maximum the, the shrinkage will be uh, on the first uh, approximation, directly proportional to the double bond density. So you should have higher shrinkage. The higher the concentration of double bonds, the higher should be the shrinkage. You will be limited by uh, the gel uh, the gel point, but you can go over the gel point using temperature, for example, or using uh, a solvent or, so, or, or something like that to keep some, some mobility in the system. So if you want to have high uh, shrinkage, use high functionality ingredients and increase the temperature to help the conversion to go, to, to go, to, to go far. Um, where do you have a more, more shrinkage? Is it in uh, UV or uh, E-beam? Uh, I believe it is in, uh, in UV if that you have more shrinkage, uh, but it depends indeed on the cure conditions. Generally, under EB, you will have a, 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 an instantaneous vitrification. And usually what we see, for example, when we try to develop matte systems with matting silica, is that the uh, uh, vitrification happens very, very fast under E-beam compared to a UV. So you will have more shrinkage under UV because your system will remain a little bit liquid, a little bit longer. Okay, mm -hmm. and the next question is from Michelle. Uh, do you have any suggestions for additives or types of oligo oligomer and monomer, which enables varnish to be applied with pet printing technology? With which type of printing? Uh, with a pet printing technology. PET. PAD, yeah, PAD. Mm -hmm. PAD, paid. Uh, I'm not an expert of the uh, of printing technology, so when I don't know, sorry. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but please contact him by, by email and I will investigate a little bit with my colleagues. Some of them are more knowledgeable than I am, and I'm sure I will find uh, some good information for you. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so then the next question is, uh, when does PPTTA will have a specific migration limit? That's a good question. I have that somewhere in my, uh, I need to check on my computer. Um, um, so give me one second. I do this live online, right? And I should be able to answer this quite quite fast. I believe uh, uh, yeah, I don't have it here. Ah, P PPTT eight is a ten PPB. Perfect, thank you. And uh, so then for the last question from uh, Gabrielle, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, for varnishes intended for E-beam technology, is it possible to, lose, to use aluminized pigments in the formulation? Could the al aluminum flakes disturb the polymerization? Uh, I don't know. Um... But it's a good question. There are some ingredients that can inhibit uh, uh, the uh, generation of free radicals uh, under E-beam. Uh, I don't know if uh, these uh, alumin aluminum flakes uh, uh, can, do, uh, can do that. 
but uh, we never tried uh, and we'll be glad to, uh, to to try it in your in your lab uh, of course okay perfect so that brings us to the end uh, of this webinar today and uh, thank you very much Xavier for your uh, very interesting presentation and for answering all the questions um, if anyone comes up with a question later on, please feel free to send it to us um, and we will be happy to, to find an answer for you. And um, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar is being recorded, so you can always listen back to it via our website. And um, that leaves me by wishing you all a very nice afternoon and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow for our last educational webinar also at 3 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very bye. much.